please help me welcome to the stage an old friend and a very talented director, Karen Kusama. And the writers and producers, Phil Hay and Matt Manfredi. I mean, that, that's really what it was, because that's kind of the final antithesis between this and other things you've done. There's really not hope so much as kind of an ambition, and this sort of free-floating ambition, but you said that was really what the character was about. Yeah, I mean, I think a big part of what drew all of us to this movie was this idea of confronting a character where you could see them in two different time frames and... Oh. and in the first, the present day, be forced to ask, what has happened to you? And in the past, start to get a little bit of insight into that transformation from somebody who had some ambition and some hope for herself to somebody who is essentially pretty much a, a, a broken human. But somebody going through the motions in a way that seems almost desperate. I mean, every in every violent encounter is really almost like a life and death situation, which makes this very different, I think, from the sort of standard thriller where there's a kind of physical domination that takes place in the fight. I mean, we really don't know who's going to win, and she always comes out with another piece missing after every single fight, doesn't she? Yeah, and I think we're just all interested in the, the reality. I mean, like, we love these kinds of movies, but we also want to see consequence and see that there's a, 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 a toll that this kind of stuff takes on a body. Yeah, guys, you can talk about that because it's amazing. And every single fight is like another piece of left almost literally on the floor in the fight, isn't there? Yeah, it's, it's you know, the, the intent was to kind of try to make it this odyssey across LA as she's kind of working towards something that she thinks is going to offer her some redemption. And so, like, part of, part of those pieces being left behind or being taken from her are, are, are in, in, I guess, it, I guess it's meant to show her desperation and drive and persistence and so like she's, she's just going to keep going. We often talked about her um, both among ourselves and with Nicole as a desert creature and that she's protecting something in her that that's her walk and that's her being is to be curled around something, and so I really, I hadn't heard it said that way before, I really love the way you said that she's kind of leaving pieces behind because it's that sort of, she's on a journey, she's like a, a, a vessel that can't get home by the end. She's lost too many things, uh, but maybe she can get somewhere that is better than where she started. I just want to talk about that because it, it feels like such an apt metaphor for me to what this character, and who this character is, that idea of these fights that she throws herself into without a plan, almost to punish herself. And we see in that final bit of the flashback where she drives her van, it's almost like she's been trying to kill herself for the last 20 years, hasn't she? Yeah, no, I think that's really true. And I think her, um, her headlong nature is both her, what is her fatal flaw, that she just goes and she just does and she doesn't think about the consequences, but it's also her power and she enters all these situations where that her ultimate power is she expresses to Jay that she, she doesn't care what happens to her by the end. And um, so yeah, so that there was always that part of her that she's, she's extremely, and Nicole talks about it all the time, that she's felt this character's rage and this character is so full of rage and a lot of it is toward all these assholes, but a lot of it is also toward herself. The funny thing, and I want to tell you about this little current, she doesn't know how to talk to anybody. At some point, she gets angry at, the, at every single person she comes in contact with. And I want to talk to you about, talk to Nicole about that, because she tends to be an actress who modulates, and just that Aaron can't help but be furious 
at every single scene, she lashes out at somebody. You know, it's funny because when Nicole talks about the role now, what she talks about as like a, a really important element to the character, which we hadn't discussed on set, but of course is so present in what she's doing, is that she's so emotionally shut down that she doesn't even know that she's having feelings, like a lot of the time. And that then it's like she erupts because she can't process all that emotional stuff in her. She, she, she's sort of trapped. And, and um, it was interesting to hear that from her later because of course that is what she's playing, someone so shut down. But even with her ex, when she's trying to give him the money to go with the kid, she even lashes out at that point. She, she, and I want to ask you all you guys about this because it struck me as being a kind of survivor's guilt. Um, that really was what the nerd was not. Yeah, you know, and, that, and that's I think what contributes to her her thing of I don't care what happens to me, which you know makes her dangerous and scary in some regards and, and tough, but also like ultimately kind of doomed. You know, the the plan gone wrong in the past that got Chris killed. Desperately trying, living in in some degree of denial and and aggressive kind of compartmentalization, and this unleashes it, it kind of untraps all that stuff in in this story, and so she has to end up somewhere different because she spent her whole and it obviously affects everything about her relationship with her daughter. They can't relate partially because she can't ever say she's wrong because if she says she's wrong about one thing it will open the floodgates to how she's actually wrong about everything, which I think is parentally maybe a rough <laughs> take on your child. <laughs> and everybody around her. I mean, it, it's, it's so interesting because I was just thinking about that character so often rich as being the kind of person who is almost like, this is almost something like fashionable about how disconnected they are, that they end up being the person for whom everything ends up coalescing. But we get a chance to see in sort of real terms, how much actual damage that kind of person would cause, that kind of lie. Yeah, I, I mean, I think in, 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 in the tradition of these movies, we, we love, well, first of all, I mean, I love genre movies, we all love genre movies, and I think it's, it's fair to say that culturally, as, as a culture, we love criminals, <laughs> and we love crime. We like the one that president. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we love them that much. Um, but at the same time, I think, the lie of these movies is they, they can get a little too easy and they can um, sort of celebrate the transgression without actually exploring the cost. And so this was a movie that was really about the cost. Because this strikes me to be in the kind of movie where, in, in, if it were like a real B picture, this is the kind of by the book character who by the end saves everybody. <laughs> <laughs> right. And it's almost like you guys, so what would this person be like in real life? I mean, that's the thing. I think people who disregard themselves and disregard others um, fairly, regularly, and consistently, and, and relentlessly sometimes um, do a lot of damage. I mean, it, it's, it is, it's, um, it's unrealistic to think of, you know, there, you, you can see, you see plenty of guard characters carrying this weight, but you don't, it just, it's just kind of off to the side, and, and something that she, the character of Aaron went through just has to have some weight to it, and has to have some effect on her life for it to be truthful, so in some ways, you know, even though we don't say it, you, you know what's happened in the, in the 17 years between that last scene you see with her and Chris, and so and and so there's just you you can we kind of cut to the wreckage and hopefully we have we hope that you understand you know what what has happened in between. Yeah, I think as Karin said, it's like the words that we kept coming back to were words like consequences and mistakes and consequences and 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 faulty attempts to atone that maybe can connect in some way. And I think yeah, I think that we always were trying to think about that about how. She's telling herself, it's funny, but it leads to a way of talking about, we sometimes talk about like the outlaw romance, which is part of this, and, and not just the, the idea of like two outlaws in love, which is her and Chris, but the 
romance of being an outlaw, and that has, is what has, in a way, seduced her and destroyed her, is this idea of getting away with it and being this, like, cowboy outlaw, and it has destroyed everything. Also, as a little bit of a tangent, just, we're, we all have kids, and just things much more minor than being responsible for someone's death <laughs> can can have epic consequences, or at least you fear they can. So, like, I don't know, as a, as a, as a parent, I'm definitely much more aware of, like, actions and consequences and, and the kind of ripple effect of those things than how, you know, like, I always think to, like, little moments in my life as a child that my parents probably did not know affected me at all, but, like, are seared, you know, so. Best parents never kill anybody, no, as far as I know. No, they were great parents. Okay, that's a real vote of confidence, I think. <laughs> but I, I, I just want to think about so many things in this movie. I mean, the way that in the soundtrack, so often the music is like that kind of almost music concrete where it's really like loud and abrasive. And, and really, so much this movie is, is about signaling in as many ways as possible her psychological deterioration. And, and even when we're not seeing it, we're hearing it, aren't we? Yeah, I mean, um, we'd always, we'd always, talked about the movie from the beginning as a pretty layered soundscape and um, and really wanted the sounds of Los Angeles, which um, I think somehow can get this rap in the rest of the country as sort of not being a real city, when in fact it's sort of like the biggest, most sprawling, most crazy city in the United States. And so for me, it was exciting to hear LA like through cars and just the assaultiveness of, of the sonic landscape. Um, and I also like those kind of choices just on a stylistic level. Well, yeah, of course. Well, I think with, also with uh, Teddy's music, it yeah. reflects something about um, what we hoped to, or realized about stories that are, that are crime stories or crime sagas, that, the ones that we love, which is they both to us have to be really um, with like two hands on reality and really a, a, a real world, but also willing to, to reach to be mythological in some way. And I think his music is is that too. Is you know it, it reflects that you know that those that's to me what. And then for us, the bottom line always was like the emotional center of it. That like if I think Karin said this before uh, that. If it's, it's it's emotional genre filmmaking, mm -hmm. where the emotions are the heart of the whole thing. Mm -hmm. Well, that, that gets to the, for me honesty, and I guess I mean because I've asked you Phil about this when we're outside, and I said it, it feels like it could at one point have almost been an ensemble piece rather than a piece of art here, and and you were saying it was kind of a long road to the script actually being written, something an idea that you guys had for a bit, but committing it to to I guess whatever you commit things to nowadays. Um, pixels. Yes, uh, pixels, thank you. Um, that was actually a much shorter uh, process, right? Yeah, yeah, I think that we spend a lot of times, it's true of our movie that we did before this, The Invitation, together, where we think about it collectively for a really long time. It's another movie about sort of like basically psychological uh, deterioration too. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Oh. And, and so we spent years thinking about, they're both kind of in tandem, they both, were happening in a weird way at the same time. And I think, you know, we were kind of thinking about the, the invitation and doing it, and then the Thieves of Destroyer, we were thinking of, it. but I think the actual- So thinking about LA. And thinking about- we wanted to keep making movies. Yeah, we sort of decided that we wanted to make movies in and about LA together. And, but the writing actually wasn't a terribly long process because we had been talking about it so much. And because it's sort of an organic thing now that we're kind of, a, you know, Karin and I are married, Matt and I have been, you know, friends for and partners for 28 years or something, and so we and Teddy, the composer, and Plummy, the editor, we're all really close, so we can just start making the movie even as we're writing the script. And so that's there's a kind of once we know what we're doing, it all happens a lot quicker. Um, it's funny because you're talking about Teddy K. Shapiro, and I was just saying you guys would came out of this. So many people I associate with comedy in this movie. Teddy's done primarily comedies. Yeah. Toby Huss, Bradley Whitford, uh, Tatiana does 
can do as much comedy as anything else. So it's interesting to have so many people who do comedy in a genre piece like this. I think um, there can be a kind of spontaneity and wildness to people who are particularly trained in comedy. And um, somebody like Bradley is a great example of like a um, brilliant actor with incredible comic timing who also um, sees the kind of perverse wit of that character. I mean, if you can call it that. He's, he thinks he's very witty. Um, <laughs> but but, I, but I, I appreciate that about the character, that you can kind of laugh uncomfortably as you're watching him be you know, sort of a scumbag. You know, um, I think it's nice to have that kind of energy in a cast. Yeah, and I think you've got these, you have these weird details that intrude upon life. <laughs> you know, like there have been plenty of like dark times where you find something oddly funny or, or something just kind of from left field comes in and distracts you. And I think having people adapt to comedy kind of kind of recognize those moments and embrace them and kind of give it, you know, ultimately more life. For example, like Tatiana, the very first thing she did was the scene in Griffith Park where she's like gets the money and she's walking to her car and they have two um, background players jogging toward her and on the first take she just that look that's in the movie where she's just so outraged and they got her way like, yeah, uh, and we were like that is just that's the character like right there and like she it's funny Tatiana's particularly like I don't think people think of her as a comic actor but she started in like yeah. In comedy, yeah. improv comedy, and sketch comedy, and she's yeah. hilarious. So, so she finds a way to, and it's what you want from this cast, and they do that, is to bring comedy that's not stinky or yeah. or it's actually something that's again getting back to uh, being imposed on the material, right? Yeah, and like honestly eccentric. I mean, I think this is a movie for the most part. I hope that it's filled with people who start to have the details and specificity um, kind of filled in as you watch. And um, a lot of these actors are just so good at um, creating those little details. And speaking of that, I guess this is a point I want to ask you about. So, Nicole Kidman, how did that happen? <laughs> um, it was such an amazing kind of serendipitous situation. She got a hold of the script before we had sent it to her. And um, how that happen? She is one of those rare movie stars who just wants to read what is out there and, and see, you know, particularly for a woman who's 50, you know, she was just like, what's out there for, for somebody like me? And um, her agent sent this script to her and she tracked us down. And it was pretty... Um, yeah, that's, that's unusual. A pretty, a pretty extraordinary experience. situation, I will say. And, um, yeah. But also it opened up the conversation. She just wanted to talk about it. And she wanted to talk about like, how do you see this character? Where did it come from? Where is she from? And so it just created this very open channel right away. And we had met before about some other stuff, but um, it's just such a, it, was, it turned out to just be the best, most open exchange. And, and it felt like a natural progression that she would end up playing the role. And we also, it was so interesting because like something that's just true about her is that she's really not a games player, and for an actor of that level, like that's a survival mechanism for so like like to keep yourself in reserve and to keep protect some part of it, whether it's before you get involved in the movie or while you're doing it and trying to. And so, I so respect and love about her that she is not that. She's just a heart on her sleeve. She tells you like. You know, the first time she got to Carmen, she just said, you know, I always wanted to work with you, and I read the script, and I cried, and that's all I need to know. And and she is that. Like, it, it's just amazing, because there's many actors out there who, and for good reason, will not read a script without a firm offer on the table or anything like that. And the, not it's just not who she is. She, she just wants to do what she wants to do. Well, I guess when she does it, probably from office kind of come around. Oh, yeah, Nicole Kidman wants to do it. We should, yeah, we should, we should, make, we should make an offer. That gets together real quick when she decides she wants to do it. Yes. <laughs> uh, so I'm wondering, though, if that kind of changed some of the ideas you had about where you wanted the character to go, because 
also she's got to come in with a bunch of ideas, doesn't she? You know, um, I mean, the, the idea that was, was, I think, kind of self-evident in a way when we were talking is she just said, it's just so important that I not, quote, look like Nicole Kidman. I really need to be this character first. And I think, you know, I mean, if you meet Nicole in person, she has flawless porcelain skin. She's got perfect posture. She's almost six feet tall. She, she, she's very regal. And so I think she understood, I need to like sort of work from the inside out to um, just transform myself. And, um, you know, that's, there was a boldness to that. Like she would have taken the look much further and, and harder. And I think, you know, we all started to agree that there was like a, a sweet spot where we could continue to engage with her, um, you know, in terms of that look and that posture and that brokenness. Um, but, you know, honestly, I think the only thing that was really different once Nicole came on board was just scaling the character up by a few years in age. Yeah, and, and like, you know, she was, like, she's so sharp. And, um, and so she, like, we would talk about, like, little small moments, but those are the things that she would hone in on, like, for instance, the scene with Jay when she pays him off. Because there was a line where she references loving her daughter, and we had a long talk about that specific thing where she's like, I don't think I admit that to him. I don't think I say that until I know I say it later, and I think that should be the only time I say it. So smart and so she's considered everything, and so those are the those are the kinds of conversations that would happen. Good. Oh, I was just going to say she also, you know, we we she she had the same instinct that we we do, which is we try to be as minimal as we can in some ways, and one of them is in kind of archaeology of the character's past and details about that, and we try to find. And she located exactly the thing that we hoped, which was the line in the scene with her daughter where she says, you know, where, where, she, where we learned that she was burned with cigarettes by her mom and that she lived in this kind of feral pack with a couple brothers, no one taking care of them. And, and Nicole said, like, that's all I need. Like, that, that inspires me, and if, if there was a lot more, it might uninspire me. I, that, that got me excited, but then after that, she asked us to write her... Um, a, a very detailed character history um, that only Karin and her have ever seen. It's really just for her. And and we wrote in exhaustive detail every single thing that happened to her from the age of five to the age of you know 40, whatever that she is in the movie, and said, that's not, this is not prescriptive. This is just our idea. And you, if something inspires you, take it. And I think that's the way she likes to do it. Like, she's like, she said that was really helpful to have that all in the background and and let whatever comes out in the movie come out, but not have it be this like textual mm -hmm. relentless bell we're ringing about what happened to her then and then and then. Because I mean, one of the lines that really works for me is in terms of that kind of sort of damage to biographies when she screams in the hospital. Doesn't everybody realize I'm trying to help? I mean, that says so much about who and what she is and this kind of helplessness, but also this damage. I mean, it's, again, I, I keep going back to that, and then leads me to the question about the title. Well, we, um, uh, a lot of times, we, we either have the title right away, or it takes forever, and this was a takes forever one. You know, like, if it doesn't happen, like, before we even know anything about what it's about, it takes a while, and this, so this, we had another title that wasn't quite right, and, and, we were kind of working through it, and then I feel like, you know, we, we had this text chain between us where we were trying to work it out, and I just felt like the word destroyer for me just came up as like, it's just a strong, first of all, it was just a strong word that I kept coming back to, and, and it means a lot of different things, you know, and I think that then we started talking about it, and Karin was saying, well, here are some of the destroyers that I see in this movie time, ambition, greed, um, this character, that character, her, you know, memory, guilt. These are all things that are, and money is a destroyer. And so 
in a weird way, it was like it started with that word and feeling strongly about it, and a quick search to determine that there hadn't been a movie in the last 20 years in the title. It's just a rest. You're always just like, please, God, no, don't. Yeah. Um, but I want a Star Wars. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, the Star Wars. Yeah, yeah. So was Solo. So you don't want to do yeah, that yeah. one either. So, so yeah. So it was. And again, it was one of those things where like it had a meaning for us in the beginning, and then it continued to kind of gain meaning. For us, but, but um, yeah. I want to talk to you in closing here about what I thought was one of my maybe one of my favorite shots that you ever done. It just tells us so much about something, and it shocked me because it didn't come from anything I expected, which is the best way to have this happen. When the die pack explodes in the parking lot, mm -hmm. and it's beautiful and terrifying at the same time. I've never seen a stage like that before. But, I mean, talk about that because it's I mean, it's one of these things that almost seems like it's something from a dream. Yeah, I mean, um, it's funny because it's it's actually one of the hardest things to physically mimic. Um, die, die pack explosions are actually super, super, super wet, um, but we were having trouble achieving like something really wet, and um, it was it was a really interesting task to evoke that die pack explosion, and. Um, Thank God we got it on the second take. Um, but, um, you know, what's funny is now I look at that sequence and note that it's quite surprising for people in the audience if they're not expecting it. And, um, and that there's something about that purple following her to That's her death. Yes, exactly. I mean, like, kind of literally, like, landing at her, the internal injuries on her belly. And, um, those were kind of the happy accidents of the movie when something would sort of seem to have some kind of aesthetic synergy, you know. Um, but yeah, that was just at the on, while we were shooting it, that was just one of those things where I was praying it would work each time. <laughs> because it, it's, it has this weird thing where it almost really actually sets the movie into motion. I mean, it's like this cloud envelops everybody in effect and never really goes away. Yeah, yeah, that's really true. That's really true. I mean, I'm glad you experienced it that way because it's probably a bit more poetic than what happens in real life, but that was the choice I, I yeah. made. <laughs> and the idea was, yeah, like you say, like the thing that, you know, we learn about those things, the whole point of those is that it's a stain that you can't get off because the cops can come find you three days later and find if there's any, you know, you can't come off your skin. And so obviously it's a really direct metaphor for everything else that happens. But oh, it's very, it's a really almost a Catholic movie. I mean, it's very kind of this mark of Cain. I mean, it's original yeah. sin. It's all these things. I'm sorry, but that's really the way I thought about it. I was raised Catholic. I don't know if that had to do with it. I was not. Protestant. Close enough. Um, <laughs> and what